Uh, saludos desde la ciudad de Galveston, que está al sur de, eh, de Houston. Y para mí es un honor presentar al doctor Brian Miller. Él es un distinguido educador, sobre todo en anatomía, y está haciendo un gran favor a nuestro programa de MacTech, introduciéndonos a nosotros este, los componentes anatómicos más importantes del sistema auditorio. A lo que quiero decirle es que el doctor Brian tiene una carrera muy distinguida de enseñanza en las escuelas de medicina, más de 25 años, él originalmente de Wisconsin, y bueno, en Texas ha estado ya mucho tiempo y realmente para mí es este un gran placer presentarlo a, a ustedes y ojalá que siga con nosotros a, asistiendo a nuestro programa, el doctor Brian Miller. Sí, muchachos. Sí, muchachos. muchachos. Hola, muchachos. Hola, muchachos. Hola, muchachos. I'm Dr. Brian Miller. I have a colleague, uh, Dr. Jackie Collins behind the camera there, and what we're going to do is give you a little tour of the anatomy of the human ear by using one of our ear models that we use um, every year in our gross anatomy course. And this is the model right here. Now this represents only a relatively small portion of the entire skull. You can see that we have the typical outer ear out here with several of its characteristic features. This little bump right here is called the tragus. It comes from a word meaning goat because as we age, little hairs grow down from it and resemble a little goat's beard. This outer rim of the ear that I'm outlining here is called the helix. And then this depression inside that if you put your finger in leads to an internal cavity is called the concha or the shell. These are components of what's called the outer ear. In uh, standard anatomy, we classify the ear as having three different components, an outer, a middle, and an inner ear component. So we've started with the outer ear, the part that's most familiar for you to see. And now what we're going to do is turn this a little bit and look as if we were looking inside the skull. This area of bone is called the temporal bone, and you have to remove pieces of the temporal bone to see the rest of the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And so I'm going to do that on our model here. Okay, if we take a look then at our outer ear out here, the helix. By the way, this whole assembly out here is sometimes called the pinna, which means a wing-like structure. You can see that there's a canal that leads from this outer aspect here all the way inside the temporal bone. This white area here is temporal bone. This is the ear canal, or auditory meatus. The word meatus is a word that simply means canal. And so with the pinna, this canal is what we refer to as the outer ear. The interesting thing about the canal in life is that, as many of you probably know or have experienced, there are a whole series of glands that produce a waxy-like substance here. And this substance, earwax, can be secreted into this canal. It supposedly helps to keep it lubricated and also uh, there's a theory that it resists insects coming in because they don't like the uh, earwax in here. Another word for earwax is cerumen. Anyway, the outer ear canal leads us to a relatively small membrane that's slanted here, as you can see. That's the eardrum, or tympanic membrane. And the tympanic membrane is the division between the outer ear components here and the small middle ear cavity, which is right in here. And it's in the middle ear cavity that we find the three smallest bones in the body malleus, incus, and stapes. What I have here is a separate eardrum or tympanic membrane. This is the outer side that the canal leads to. And then on the inner side you can see several structures including two bones. Let me just look at these for a second. Here are two bones that are on the inside of the tympanic membrane or eardrum. The bone that actually attaches to the eardrum is called the malleus, or hammer. It has a club-shaped appearance, as you can see up here. It's going to articulate or contact the next bone here that looks like a big tooth, and that's called the incus, or the anvil. 
And then the incus at this little point here connects to a third bone we'll see in a minute that's still inside the middle ear called the stapes. So you have three bones, malleus, incus, and we'll show you the stapes in a minute, that are going to be inside the tympanic membrane and be the major components of the middle ear. There are some other interesting features you can see here. One is that a nerve, a branch of one of the cranial nerves, crosses this space between the mal malleus and incus right here. This nerve is called the corda tympani, or the cord of the tympanic membrane. It actually goes all the way through the middle ear cavity forward, works its way into the mouth and down to the tongue, and it's carrying taste fibers to the anterior or front parts of the tongue. It's a very unusual setting to have a nerve travel in isolation like this, go from one cavity to another, carrying fibers that have nothing to do with hearing, for example, but actually are going to be responsible for tongue function. That's called the corda tympani. Another little element we can see here is just a tiny little fragment of what in life is a slightly longer muscle called the tensor tympani. It's a very tiny muscle, and as you can see here, it attaches to a portion of the malleus. Its job is going to be to help dampen or reduce the oscillation or vibration of the bones here, the ossicles, and that helps protect the brain against excessively loud noises and sounds. So this is what, if we go back down here now to our ear canal, here's the now coming in, canal coming in. Here is, this is basically what I've just showed you, our structures just on this far side or inner side of the tympanic membrane. So what I'm going to do now is take out the tympanic membrane from this model and the two bones, the malleus and incus, and you'll see the third bone sitting right here. That's the stapes, or the stirrup. It looks a little bit like a conventional stirrup. It has a little gap there, you can see. That is the third of the three ossicles, or the three middle ear bones. The stapes then communicates with the structures that we call the inner ear structures. And these structures are highlighted here in this model by sort of being um, carved out. In fact, the inner ear structures are not separate structures that appear inside a cavity. They are simply uh, cavities inside the bone itself. And the, the configuration of what you see here would be what you would see if you filled up the inner ear cavities and caverns and spaces with wax and then chiseled away all the bones, you'd have this funny looking structure right here. So this is the inner ear components and there are two regions that are distinct from one another. This area over here that has a sort of spiral twist, looks like a snail shell, is called the cochlea. That's the area that's going to serve the sensation of hearing. And this area back here with this swelling that has these three ducts emanating from it, is called the vestibule, and these three ducts, all at different angles to each other, at right angles to each other, are referred to as the semicircular ducts. The vestibule and its associated ducts are concerned with the sensation of balance. Okay? So there are actually two components or two sensations that are served by the inner ear structures, hearing from the cochlea, and balance from the vestibule and its associated ducts. And you can see that our little friend, the stapes down here, actually is going to attach right at the vestibule. And you can't see this from this view, but inside these structures are going to be several fluid-filled canals and passageways. If we take off part of the cochlea, you may be able to see that a little better. These spaces in here represent fluid-filled passageways. And the yellow structure right here is the big cranial nerve, the eighth cranial nerve. There are 12 altogether, 12 pairs of nerve. This is the eighth cranial nerve, called the acoustic nerve or auditory nerve or vestibular cochlear nerve. And all the sensations that come from the inner ear, either of hearing or balance, will be transmitted to the brain along this nerve. Getting back to the cochlea, and you'll find a similar sort of pattern inside the vestibule here, there are fluid-filled cavities here. And the idea, as we'll see, is that moving the fluid back and forth here, or setting up vibrations or waves in the fluid, will stimulate very tiny, small, microscopic hair cells 
that are sitting on the edges of these spaces here. And those little hair cells are going to be connected to the nerve. As those hair cells actually move back and forth, they'll set up little electrical signals that are carried by the nerve back to the brain. And that's what the brain interprets as sound of one frequency or another. If the little hair cells are being vibrated in the vestibule and carried back, those sensations tell the brain what position the body or head is in. So it gives us information about how we can balance ourselves. Okay, I'm going to reassemble this to some degree and now go through a little bit of how the entire assembly works from the outer ear through the middle ear to the inner ear. Okay, so now what we're going to do is travel along from outer to middle of the inner ear the way a sound wave would travel. First of all, sound is collected in this outer pinna here. Humans don't, most of us don't have the ability to move our outer ear, but uh, several animals still do. They retain muscles around the ear that allows it to point in different directions so it can collect sound waves coming from different directions around the animal's head. We tend not to have that, and so most humans turn their head when they want to collect a sound wave toward the source of the sound. The sound wave will enter the outer ear, travel down the ear canal, and bounce against the tympanic membrane. When it bounces against the tympanic membrane, the little ossicles on the tympanic membrane we talked about, the malleus, the ingus, and the stapes, will begin to vibrate. And that vibrate vibration then will be carried into the little hair cells and their fluid field passageway of the inner ear and that will set up signals that will go to the brain via this large eighth cranial nerve that we interpret as sound. Now at any given region, outer, middle, or inner ear, there can be problems that either will cause diminished or loss of hearing. One of the typical things that causes a diminished or lost hearing in the outer ear is an excessive secretion of earwax or cerumen that can plug up the ear canal. And so the airwaves have much more difficulty getting through there and it diminishes the sound and we interpret that as a loss of hearing. Another thing that can happen for those of you who go swimming is that the tissues around here, if water gets in here, will swell up and become inflamed. That gives us a condition called otitis or inflammation of the ear. And if the otitis is out here in the ear canal, it's called otitis externa. Again, because it'll swell up this passageway, make it smaller, it makes it more difficult for sound waves to travel through to the middle ear. Now, once we reach the middle ear, there are several things that can happen. One of the things that can happen is that the bones in here okay, can sometimes be overgrown by other bony structures or by inflammation in the middle ear, and that can cause them to vibrate with far less force and frequency. That can also be uh, a way we get what's called conductive hearing loss. Secondly, if we look back to this particular area here, we see this little canal. Okay. This canal is connecting from the region of the throat down here with the middle ear. This is called the auditory tube or eustachian tube. The eustachian tube provides a pathway from the back of the throat, right behind the nasal cavities, all the way up to the middle ear. And what this means is that if we get a bacterial or viral infection down in our mouth and throat, that can travel all the way up to the eustachian tube and set up an inflammation or an otitis in the middle ear. But if it's in the middle ear area, that's called otitis media, as opposed to otitis externa here. Otitis media, inflammation of the middle ear, is very often accompanied by fluid buildup. And that fluid buildup can build up to such a pressure here that it stops the tympanic membrane from uh, vibrating easily or the ossicles from vibrating easily. A physician, when they inspect your ear, can't see the middle ear directly. But they can actually look through the semi-transparent tympanic membrane and see if there might be any fluid in there. If you have chronic fluid buildup and persistent problems with hearing, sometimes they'll actually poke little holes in the bottom of the eardrum and let that fluid escape. 
So otitis externa can affect hearing in the outer ear, otitis media in the middle ear. Most of the damage that occurs that affects hearing in the inner ear here, in the cochlea, for example, is due to the loss or the partial destruction or the wear and tear on the tiny little hair cells inside the cochlea. And in fact, this is what happens as we age. These little hair cells with time will get worn down a little bit. They won't react as readily to sounds and will start losing hearing. And this starts at very high frequency ranges. Even in about your mid-20s, you start losing the ability to hear very high frequency sounds that are easily heard by people who are teenagers. And this is typically a reflection of the loss or the wear and tear on the little hair cells inside the cochlea. So at any of the three regions, outer, middle, or inner ear, you can have damage, inflammation, wear and tear, loss of, um, of the sensory neural hair cells that can all result in a hearing loss. You can also get similar damage from trauma. For example, if you go deep sea diving and aren't careful, the change in pressure that can occur suddenly can rupture the eardrum here. That can cause a hearing loss. Or if you have severe injury to the head, you can actually break away some of the attachments of the ossicles so they don't move as easily. That can also cause a hearing loss. Or you can get damage that would damage the cranial nerve here, cranial nerve 8, that carries the signals. So there are several ways that doctors have to uh, explore when there's a hearing loss to determine if it's due to problems in the outer ear, in the middle ear, or in the inner ear. And the therapies for each of these are somewhat different also. All right. I think that's it. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't know about that.